So won't you please open the scriptures to Mark chapter two. Mark chapter two, and we're gonna read from verses one to 12. It's on page 34 in the New Testament. So as you turn to Mark chapter two, page 34, um, this passage that we're gonna look at is the first of five narratives that Mark puts together. And from Matthew, uh, sorry, from Mark chapter two, verse one, which we're gonna read, to chapter three, verse six, Mark records five showdowns with the religious leaders. And Jesus is beginning to make waves. This is right early in the gospel. This is only Mark chapter two, and Jesus is making waves. Uh, He's demonstrating his power, which we've been singing about, his authority. It's beginning to threaten the religious leaders, and it's as though seeds of hatred are busy being sown. And as we gear up for Easter, pretty much around the corner, we're gonna see these seeds that are sown here early in the gospel begin to blossom and bloom to the point where the hatred is so intense that the religious leaders arrange for Jesus to be hung upon the cross. But in our account today, Jesus will meet a man. And how he deals with this man is gonna be a powerful demonstration of Christ's power and authority because there's God's authority and then there's your authority and my authority, and it's gonna be challenged, it's gonna be exposed, and the religious leaders are gonna be left with undeniable proof of who Jesus is, and that he has all authority on heaven and on earth. And in some sense, Jesus is gonna come and he's gonna challenge the hecklers in the crowd. These religious leaders are kind of heckling in their minds, they're thinking a whole lot of stuff, and if I could use modern lingo, Jesus is gonna demolish their arguments, he's gonna do a mic drop, and he's gonna walk off stage, and every jaw is gonna drop and people are gonna be saying, we have never ever seen anything like this. So let's dive in, Mark chapter two and verse one. And to keep the suspense, you may know this story if you've been around church a while, but if you don't, even better for you because yeah, let's unpack it as it goes and see the beauty of our Lord here. So verse one for now. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So you'll remember week one, we looked at the healing of the leper back in chapter one of Mark, and obviously the crowds go wild, the word about Jesus spreads like wildfire, and so we read that Jesus kind of lays low for a while. He knows that these seeds of hatred are being sown, and he doesn't want to bring about the crucifixion too early. And so he lays low before he returns to Capernaum. Now we need to understand that Capernaum is the center of Christ's public ministry. In fact, Mark tells us in verse one that Capernaum was even regarded as Jesus' home because he stayed here so often. I think something like five different disciples actually lived at Capernaum at one point. So the passage we're gonna read, Jesus is probably at Peter and Andrew's home. And if you've been to Israel, you know that they've actually excavated what they think is Peter's home. And I've stood there, it's an incredible sight. And there's evidence was right near the synagogue there. So uh, Capernaum's an important place. And if Twitter had existed, This is what would have been trending on Twitter. Jesus has come home. And so we pick up the story in verse two with crowds that are now swarming around the house of Peter and Andrew. And Mark tells us in verse two, so many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. So these homes, as I said, have been excavated and they're pretty small. Most of the homes in Capernaum, a room in that house is probably not wider than five meters because it was dependent on the wooden beams that went across the top. So that was the length of tree trunks and so the the rooms kind of took that kind of size. Maybe it was in Lebanon where they had those massive cedars that maybe the rooms are wider there, I don't know. But the point is there's a crowd that is crammed inside this little space and I don't know if you've had a you know, bumper Bible study in your home and had people standing on top of the furniture, squashed into the corners. This is kind of the picture that you've got here, just sardines packed in. Not only that, they're spilling out of the doorway. Mark even tells us there's not even room in the doorway and they're going out into the streets and there's just this crowd and they're craning their necks and they're straining their ears to hear Jesus preach the word of God. But what's this? Here come some latecomers. These, these guys have walked in here now, honestly, they really think that they're gonna find a seat now. Golden circle tickets, doesn't really matter. They're not gonna get through to, to be right in front of Jesus, not a chance. We pick it up in verse three. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. 
There's this picture, there's four men are carrying a mattress, each one of them is holding a different corner of this mattress, and on top of the mattress is man number five, a guy who is paralyzed. And we don't know much about his paralysis. Maybe he was paralyzed from birth, maybe he was in some accident, maybe his legs got crushed, maybe he fell in some way, injured his spine, but, but we don't know, but he's paralyzed. And I can imagine the crowd shouting, hey, come on, Oaks. Back of the line, you guys are not getting through here with a mattress. This is a roadblock here. You're not gonna drive this mattress through into the lounge. Not a chance. Back of the line, buddy. But these men are desperate, desperate to carry their friend to Jesus. No matter what, no matter what gets in their way, no matter what obstacles, no matter what hindrances, because they see their friend's condition and they've recognized that Jesus is the power to heal. And so they realize, okay, we're not gonna get in there. It's impossible with this crowd, so they hatch a plan that has been making us smile for the last 2,000 years. And it's so memorable. I think the disciples must have like, you know, around the, the bride, they must, remember, remember this story? It, it, it just again moved my heart. So here it is in verse four. This is their plan. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus. And after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. Now to help us understand this, homes in those days had a flat roof. And uh, outside was the staircase that went pretty steeply up onto the flat roof of those homes. And the reason the roofs were flat is, is sometimes people would sleep up there if it was really hot, they'd sometimes go up and the homes were small so that's where you could do some of your work and so on. And the roofs weren't actually flimsy, they were fairly strong. It was constructed, as I said, with these wooden beams and then they would thatch over the beams and then on top of the thatch they'd put like thick mud layer which would obviously harden in the sun and that mud layer, they'd have to change annually before the rainy season. So yeah, in some sense, don't think of it as a roof like this. It wouldn't have been uh, you know, that difficult to, to, to get through it. But I still want you to, to kind of just picture the scene. Here's four men carrying a paralytic up on this mattress, up a steep flight of stairs. I mean, it's quite an incredible thing. We've got to admire their faith and their love and their determination. I remember a friend in Cape Town inviting me to help him move, and he lived on the sixth story of a block of flats. And my job was to carry down the double bed mattress. I can't tell you how hard that was. The elevator wasn't working. There were a couple of times as I was going down those floors, I thought, I'm just gonna turf it over there, and this thing will just waft its way down to the bucky. But trying to negotiate those corners, and I was going downhill. But then I was thinking, imagine going uphill like these guys. Imagine if I'd put my second cousin, who sadly 18 years ago became paralyzed from the neck down from an accident. Imagine if Tracy was on, on there and, and I was having to, to, to carry her up there carefully with some other guys. I mean, it's an incredible picture. And once they get onto the roof, Mark writes so descriptively in the Greek, and it doesn't come out in the English. This is what the literal Greek says. They unroofed the roof. They unroofed the roof. There's actually a word in the Greek for unroofing. So if you... Yeah, look it up. But they de-roofed the roof, and then Mark adds this graphic picture, they started like digging it out, digging out the mud. I mean, imagine being there inside. Here we are this morning, you know, the preacher is preaching, we hear a commotion on the roof, suddenly, you know, light is streaming through and we're getting dust in our eyes and there's mud falling and thatch and all of that. Next thing, there's a silhouette of some ropes and some guy being lowered down. I mean, it's, it's an incredible picture some kind of bedroll mattress, and then there's light streaming through the dust, and and suddenly he lands here on the floor, and he's right in front of Jesus. I mean, if this was Mission Impossible number 10, the guys, the the, the theme tune would have been playing, and it would have been like, mission accomplished, roll credits. I mean, we've got him to Jesus. And Matthew tells us in verse five that Jesus saw their faith, plural. Not just the faith of this guy, I was thinking to, what must it have been like for him on that mattress? What faith must he have had? I don't know, maybe he had so much courage, maybe he said, guys, it doesn't matter if you drop me, I'm already paralyzed, let's just go for this. I don't know. But he had to have faith. I mean, what can really go wrong? I can't be worse off than I am. But but the faith of the four guys? I mean, they also had faith, and Jesus sees their faith. When Jesus saw their faith, this was a team effort, and their faith was loving. That's the first thing I see about their faith. They couldn't bear to see their friend in this condition. I mean, scarred emotionally and physically, all the things that he couldn't do, things that maybe if they were close friends they'd done before. 
And, and, and now this, this healer is in town, this, this, this man that could be the son of God. I mean, we've seen what he's done with a leper. If we could just get him to you, he, he's a compassionate guy. They love for their friend. And in a sense, God loves us so much. Jesus is the friend of sinners. He's our friend. And think about it. Jesus sees us in our paralyzed condition. We can't walk in righteousness. I can't walk a day in righteousness by myself. Apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus says. You're an invalid, you're paralyzed. You, in fact, you're worse, you're dead in your transgressions and sins and it's as though God broke through the roof of the world and lowered his son into our domain so that he could hang on a cross. That's how much God loves you. And that's how much the Holy Spirit this morning, even as we come to this communion table, wants to bring you to Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit loves more than anything else. He wants to magnify Christ. He wants to make Christ great. He wants to lead us in surrender so that we fall to our knees before this table because the table points to Christ and he wants to bring us to Christ that we might be cleansed afresh. But not only was their faith loving, it was persevering. I mean, imagine if they just left their friend in the dirt, the first person that said, sorry, you're not coming in here. The bouncer said, sorry, can I see your ID? Sorry, to full, you know. But, but they pushed through. And, and that's what true faith does. It, it, it kind of has this, this bold tenacity that kind of just pushes through and it, it does things that you didn't think you would do. Uh, if you guys knew what I was naturally like in my own personality and sometimes quivering as I've driven off to, to speak to people or done certain things and afterwards I say, Lord, that's only by your grace because I know myself. I'm weak, I'm trembling, I'm shy, whatever it is. The crowd was big the obstacles were great but true faith is not deterred by obstacles. And I also thought their faith was sacrificial. I mean, I don't know, if it was Peter's house, he was a practical guy, maybe he'd already got out his calculator and thinking, hang on a minute, who's repairing this roof? These guys must have thought about, look what we're about to like, do malicious damage to property, you know, let's make sure that we can come back. It would have cost them labor, time, energy, finance to, to, to fix that. There was a cost associated with it. And then their faith was creative and risk-taking and bold. They had to look, what, what do we have in our arsenal? You know, do we have rope? What have we got? Maybe they had an engineer there. How are we gonna construct something so that this guy can go down? I, I mean, this was creative. This was, this was risk-taking, weighing up the various options. And their faith was communal. There were four guys because that's what was needed. I don't think two could have done it. One could have done it. The paralytic couldn't, couldn't have done it by himself. So there was this community and that's why God got us in church this morning because there are things that we can do as a church that we could never do on our own. Great exploits for God and as we look back on 114 years of history, the things that God has done through us because we've joined together. They needed each other to bring their friend to Christ and so be thankful that you don't just go it alone. The people that you've got a burden for, how can you involve other people? How can you be praying together? Because this text encourages me that God often uses others to bring us to Christ. And even as you come to the table this morning, maybe think back on who it was. Who first shared the gospel with you? Was it a member of your family? Was it your friendship circle? Maybe it was a stranger. Maybe it was a missionary. Maybe it was a broadcast. Maybe it's somebody you've never even met. Who was it that brought you to Christ? Their life and their words and their example is what kind of carried you on this, this mattress of influence to Christ. What a joy for us to just give thanks to God for, for those that have loved us in this way. But I think true faith is something that has to demonstrate itself. True faith is something that has to be active. Sometimes I'm sad when people say to me, Justin, my faith is private. You know, I, I don't talk about my faith because you know, my faith is just between me and God. It's something very personal. But true faith cannot be silent. True faith has to see paralysis around you. True faith has to say, how do I bring my friends who don't know Christ to him? How do I even move them one step forward, one step up, so to speak? We were once unable to walk. We were once outside of Christ and God has given us new legs to be able to run to him, new legs to be able to bring others a strength and a joy and a grace to bring others. Friends, this morning, isn't it tragic to be as driven as these men, but in other pursuits, in the pursuit of money, in the pursuit of business sales, in the pursuit of a degree, in the pursuit of, of looking good and healthy, in the pursuit of, of, of going on a great date with somebody, 
There's nothing wrong with those things, but, but when we pursue all of those things, but we don't pursue bringing people to Christ, then there's something wrong. Surely we should use as much energy. Think of the amount of time that you invest in those things, the energy you invest in those things, the creativity, the boldness, the risk-taking, all the things we've spoken about. Is that as true in your gospel witness as you bring your friends to see Jesus? Do we have a faith that pursues and prays and strategizes and dreams and loves and calls and sacrifices like these men did? As the church, in community, we must spur one another on to advance against the gates of hell. What a joy to spur one another on. That's the power of encouragement. And so these men dared to do the difficult, the dangerous, and the controversial to bring their friend to Christ, and Jesus sees their faith. So let's switch back. Everyone on the inside has been sitting on the edge of their seats. I mean, there's dust everywhere. They're thinking, is this guy gonna fall? And suddenly he lands safely in front of Christ. And now there's a hush in the crowd. And they say to themselves, let's watch this. Jesus is going to immediately say the words and he's gonna be healed. And so here are the words that fall from the lips of Jesus in verse five. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. I don't know about you, I read that and I thought, what, he didn't heal him? Jesus just says, son or child, your sins are forgiven. Yes, he's using a family word to reassure him that he's loved and he's, he, that Jesus is compassionate, but what a strange thing to say. I can hear the crowds muttering to themselves, those critics in the crowd saying, sorry, what, Jesus? This guy has come all this way He's, he's got over all these hurdles, all these obstacles, he's come down, and now instead of healing him immediately, you wanna preach a sermon about sin and forgiveness. Don't many think the same today when they come to church? I've got my immediate needs that I want Jesus to meet. I've come here because my marriage is in trouble, I've got family problems, it's my health, it's my work, it's, it's, it's things in my life that are, that are just painful at the moment. And now the preacher wants to talk to me about sin and forgiveness. You know, maybe I should find another house in Capernaum with another Jesus who can give me a, a message that's gonna help me in, in the immediate. It's preached to my felt needs. Some kind of TED talk with motivational sound bites that's gonna boost me in my self-esteem so I can be hyped up, rah, rah, for the week ahead. But I mean, sin, that's outdated. That, that, that is irrelevant. Church that preaches still about sin that's awkward. Boost my self-esteem, preacher. But Jesus' philosophy of ministry goes far deeper. And the amazing irony is that sometimes we come to Jesus even with the wrong motives for one thing, and in his grace, we leave having received something else. We come with one symptom and Jesus says, I wanna go far deeper. I, you have an internal bleeding because of sin in your life. You don't even recognize it. You've come because of the symptom because you're looking for a girl or you, you, you want some great coffee or whatever it is. But I wanna, I wanna stop this internal bleeding. And Jesus treats the man's greatest need first and your greatest need is the need for forgiveness from God. Maybe this man felt under the curse of God you know, this is my fault, I've done something wrong, that's why God has made me paralyzed. And he felt under the curse of God and his weight, and maybe Jesus was doing this to, to remind him that this is a prelude to healing. Maybe people in the crowd saw this connection like Job's friends did. Oh, you must have sinned there, that's why you've done this wrong. There's a direct connection between your sin and disease. Sometimes there is, but Jesus often says, even in the Gospels, that often there isn't a direct, that sin caused that. Yes, general sin, the fall of man, for sure. And so I think Jesus wants to do something deeper here. He wants to use the story in this man to point not so much to the man, but to himself. All these stories we've looked at, people Jesus met, the point is to magnify Christ, to point to him, and Jesus wants to show us his power and his authority. And the religious leaders are gonna squirm. So the focus now shifts to them. The focus now shifts from the physical paralytic to the teachers of the law that are sitting there. And they are actually the real paralytics. Why do I say that? Because the teachers of the law are paralyzed. They're sitting on their hands, they're sitting on their feet, 
They're comfortable. We don't read that they got up to help this man. We don't read that they stepped out to say, let's help steady this guy, let's help him. I mean, the religious leaders shouldn't have been in the front seats. They should have been outside. They should have been saying, who really needs Christ? Who do we need to bring in here? Let me make room for you. Come, you need the gospel. But there they are sitting, comfortable. They're close to Jesus. They've got the best seats. They're busy with religious stuff, but they're paralyzed inside and they don't recognize it. And we can be like them. I remember in one of our review meetings, we review the services every Tuesday, and about two years ago I heard about two ladies. Maybe they're in the church today, I have no idea. But they went up to two of our guests because the guests told us this. And they said, sorry, you're in our seats, please can you move? I mean, how welcoming is that? You know, so just, just think about it. That, that's my parking, that's my seat, that's, really? We want, we want to be a church that is welcoming. I mean, I wish more people sat in the front rows because, I mean, my sermon's not working because there aren't any Pharisees, oh, actually, Nick Tudor, <laughs> sitting in the front row. But give up your seat, Nick. <laughs> but I think you see where I'm going with this. J.C. Ryle said something that really challenged me. He said, what great spiritual privileges some persons enjoy and yet make no use of them. Whew. What great spiritual privileges some persons enjoy and make no use of them. They're right by Christ. They, they know the law, but the, they miss the bleeding obvious. And look what Jesus says to them later. You can see kind of the hostility growing because Jesus is speaking truth more and more and more. And as he gets to the cross, Matthew 23, Jesus says, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Do not do what they do for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. And that's the irony, sometimes the biggest critics in church are those that are not willing to lift a finger to help somebody towards Christ. Jesus goes on, everything they do is done for men to see. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. And that's the danger of being paralyzed. They didn't even realize that they themselves, as close as they were to Jesus, had not entered in. And they weren't even willing for others to enter in. And they were nitpicking, they were straining out gnats. And Jesus said, you didn't even realize, you've, you've swallowed a camel. Without recognizing our own paralysis, without recognizing our need for Christ as we come to this table, there is a Pharisee within all of us. The last thing we wanna do is think, ah, oh, Justin's preaching about those Pharisees I know. Trat, she's not here this morning. He's not here this morning. No. I need Christ. I am paralyzed without him. I have a Pharisee within that I need to put to death with the gospel. So let's see these teachers of the law in verse six. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves. They didn't have the guts to verbalize this. They were just thinking these things in their hearts. Verse seven. Why does this fellow talk like that? Referring back to the fact that Jesus could just say, my son, your sins are forgiven. Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now before we jump on their theology, their theology was right. They probably were right to be disturbed. This is what they realize. This is blasphemy. This is pure arrogance. How can an ordinary man forgive sins? How can he, that is God's prerogative. How, how can he say that? This is an affront to the majesty of God. They even say, this fellow, why does this fellow think that he can talk like this way? Why, why is he doing what only God can do? Who can declare someone forgiven just by their own authority? He has no authority to do this, can you see? It's about power and authority, and so they say, who can forgive sins but God alone? The punishment for this kind of blasphemy was death. Yes, you had to have irrefutable evidence, so they were kind of shifting, they didn't have enough at this point, but they began to, 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 to gain more and more evidence until they put Christ to death. Later in Mark, 
this will be the very reason that Christ is hung on the cross. It's because of what he claimed. Yes, they believed he was an imposter, but they knew what he was claiming. That's unlike the Jehovah's Witnesses, and maybe you've had them knock at your gate or come into your property. Over the years, I've uh, had them in my home many, many times, and um, one of the things that they, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe is that Jesus is not God and that he never claimed to be God. And they, they've challenged me, Jesus never claimed to be God. And I've asked one simple question, then please tell me why he was hung upon the cross. And they don't have an answer. Well, uh, people just sort of misunderstood. No, they hung him on the cross because they knew exactly what he's claiming. Yes, call him a liar if you want. Call him an imposter, but don't say he never claimed that. They hung him there because they knew what he was claiming. Look what happens later. Mark 14. After Jesus asked, are you the Christ, the son of the living God? And he says, I am. We read in Mark 14, 63, the high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You've heard the blasphemy, what do you think? And they all condemned him as worthy of death. So the story is really about authority. God's rule challenges every other authority. And you might be challenged this morning. There might be a sin in your life and you say, I think that's not wrong, and God says, I think it is. You might have a leader challenging you about your sin, and you say, leave me alone, who do you think you are? That's the power struggle. It's between God's authority, and I wanna be my authority. I wanna be sovereign. I wanna know everything. I wanna be the controlling one. Jesus is claiming authority over everything and everyone, even over sin. And now he does something mind-blowingly brilliant. Here it is in verse eight. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking. He is omniscient God, he can perceive people's hearts. He knew what they were thinking in their hearts. They didn't have the guts to verbalize, but he knew it. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? Okay, this is brilliant. He knows what they're thinking and he asks this counter question. If you read these other five narratives as well, uh, just Jesus' questions and his, his brilliance as, as the God of truth to just demolish falsehood is, is just phenomenal. Jesus is using what people who study logic call an a fortiori argument. And it simply means if something more difficult can be achieved, then it guarantees that the easier thing is basically a done deal, it's valid. So if we kind of reverse the argument, if you know that your teacher is not gonna give you even 10 marks more, that's the easier thing, then it is incredibly impossible that your teacher's gonna give you 20 marks more. Okay, so you're arguing from the lesser to the greater, and Jesus is kind of arguing the opposite way around, from the greater to the lesser. So from their perspective, they're thinking, come on, Jesus. Anybody can just say the words. I mean, talk is cheap. Your sins are forgiven. I mean, you could come to me at the end of the service, bow down, I could say, my son, your sins are forgiven. My daughter, your sins, anybody can say that. So how, how do we prove that? We can't go to heaven, we can't see if God backs that up, we can't see if it's got your, God's approval. And, and anyway, how can you forgive somebody on behalf of somebody else? You weren't the one sinned against, God was sinned against. So only he can release us and pardon us from that. So who do you think you are doing that? Sorry, we don't believe it. That's really easy. But Jesus knows that forgiving someone's sins is actually the harder part. And it's actually easier to heal someone, but from their perspective, they're thinking, well, it's way harder to heal someone. I mean, this guy's a fraudster. But I mean, forgiving sins, that's easy. And Jesus says, no, it's the other way around, and I'll tell you why. Because Jesus knows that God cannot just forgive anyone. Because otherwise, why did we need the cross? Sometimes we just think, oh, God can just say, I forgive you, I forgive you. He can't. Somebody has to always pay the price. There's always a cost to forgiveness. There's always God's justice. And so Jesus knows it's harder because he knows a few chapters on he's gonna be hanging on the cross. And the only reason he can say, son, your sins are forgiven is because he will be the one carrying the sins on the cross. So forgiveness is actually the harder of the two. And so do you wanna know if Jesus has the authority to forgive sins? Well, watch what happens to guarantee it. Let's pick it up again in verse nine. Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, 
take your mat and go home. And he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Do you see why I said if Jesus lived today, he would have dropped the mic, and he would have walked off stage. And everyone's like, what? I mean, it, it is incredible, this is staggering. Jesus did what was impossible in their minds. He did the harder thing in their minds. He did the thing that could be verified before their eyes, which now proved that he was God. He was making a claim to divinity. He was saying, if I can do the thing that you said was hard, then it actually means I have the blessing and the authority of God to forgive sins. Staggering claim. And here we are today. We're the religious, and we're sitting in this house, and in some sense, yes, thousands of years later, but we also see this story. We also see this man coming into our midst through Mark. So how are you gonna respond? Are you gonna react to Jesus and his authority over your life, or are you gonna fall on your knees as I did this week in worship and wonder, Lord, you've blown my mind again. This is, this is like, man, this is just your, your, your power. But the danger this morning is that we resist Christ's authority instead of falling to our knees and surrender. You see, signs and wonders must point us to Christ. We're supposed to marvel at Christ, not get caught up with the bread and the wine. We've got to get caught up with Christ. Those are symbols, those are reminders, those are signs. And so many get caught up with a sensational and not enough with Christ. I saw that at Bible College, where people spent more time studying heresy and studying the cults and what they believed. It's like, have you ever studied Christ? Are you worshiping Christ? No, no, but I can defend the church against all this evil and I know about these heresies and these creeds. It's like, what, where's Christ? That, that's the wrong imbalance. Or a, a friend I knew who always wanted the next hyped up event. Justin, you gotta watch this DVD. This guy died and he came back from hell. He tells us exactly what hell is like. Everybody's gotta watch this. Then next week, Justin, you gotta watch this DVD. This guy was stung by a jellyfish. It's the most electrifying jellyfish on the planet and he went to heaven. Now, you gotta to listen to what heaven's like. Let's go to this church. There's this wonder worker there. <clears throat> but I never remember him getting excited about Christ, about the word of God. I think it's a challenge, especially in this day and age. But the healing of the paralytic was a sign that irrefutably proved that Jesus had come near, God in the flesh. And you may have come to church this morning for all sorts of reasons. Maybe it's the music, maybe it's the great coffee, maybe you were dragged here by your parents, you young guys up the back there. <laughs> maybe you dragged your parents here, I've had that. Young guys that have really gotten fire for God, mom and dad, let's get up, let's go to church. Maybe it's because we provide kids ministry. Maybe it's your situation. I don't know why you've come, but I wanna ask you as we come to this table, have you come here this morning to hear Jesus' words, my son, my daughter, your sins are forgiven? That is the greatest news you can hear, and if you've come for anything else, as great as it is, that is secondary to hearing those words. And look at how the paralytic responds. In verse 12, our last verse. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we've never seen anything like this. Do you realize that he could have continued to lie there? This was actually obedient faith on his behalf. Jesus spoke, he could have said, oh, woe is me, I'm still a paralytic, I don't look any different, I'm gonna stay here, I'm gonna listen to the skeptics. No, he had to hear Christ's word and he had to respond and obey. And so the question for us is if Jesus says he has forgiven you, if you are in Christ, do you believe that? or do you still limp around as though you're a paralytic? It's like, I know I'm forgiven, but actually I'm more like a paralytic. I'm just gonna sit here and wallow in my paralysis. No, friends. How many still live in bondage to their sin, even though they've repented and are declared righteous and forgiven by Christ? I remember this dear lady in her 60s, and I journeyed with her for many, many years, but every time something went wrong in her life, even though she was a true born-again believer, she kept blaming God. And she'd say, well, remember, I got pregnant out of wedlock three decades ago, four decades ago. This has happened again. God is punishing me. I shouldn't have done that. And she couldn't walk in freedom. And I want to say, brothers and sisters, stop moping around. Stop lying there if you've been forgiven by Christ. Get up. Walk. Take your mat. Take your past life and carry it. Don't let it carry you. And walk out in freedom and forgiveness. 
This paralytic walked out as a living, breathing object lesson of Jesus Christ's power over sickness and sin in full view of everyone. When people view your life, what do they see? Your closest friends, your spouse, your neighbors? Can they see in full view of everyone that your life has been transformed? Or is this some kind of half-baked miracle where you're still half limping along? No, Christ must transform you through and through if you're a true Christian. Has Christ changed you? Too many Christians look no different from the world. They still look like they're lying on their mat when what's offered to them is freedom and forgiveness. Friends, I can't promise you today that Jesus will heal you physically. Paul, probably more godly than most of us, had this thorn in the flesh that three times he pleaded. And for God, in his wisdom, I don't know why, maybe Paul would have had an even more successful ministry. Who knows, that's God's sovereignty. We leave that with him. But he left Paul with whatever that ailment was and said, my grace is sufficient for you. Can God heal? Of course he can. But sometimes he doesn't. But, but what he does promise is dealing with our paralysis on the inside because true healing, total healing will come one day. That is his promise. But forgiveness is our deepest need in this life and he offers us the gospel. So as I close, can I leave you with one final observation? An observation from this crowd. We ended with a crowd in Capernaum. And maybe you read that and you thought, this is brilliant. It says everybody you know, was praising God and filled with awe and wonder. But I wanna tell you that was a superficial crowd response and that's often the case with the crowds in scripture. If you go with the crowd, one week they hear rah, rah, the next week they're there, blah, blah. <laughs> that's the crowd. No other city enjoyed Christ's presence more. Capernaum saw more miracles, heard more teaching. They had a synagogue there. Jesus used to preach in that synagogue. They were a privileged bunch of people. The crowds are gathered, but you know what we discover? Christ had very little impact in their lives. And people might see, say, I see, I told you, the problem was with the preacher and his message. Maybe if he changed the preacher or the message, we cannot get a more perfect preacher and a perfect message than Christ. And yet their hearts remained hard. They remained dead in their sins, unforgiven. Because look what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 23 about Capernaum. Matthew 11, 23. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, Sodom of all places, if it had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day but I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Sometimes nothing hardens someone's heart more than hearing the gospel over and over again, but still choosing sin, still choosing the world. And here we are this morning hearing the gospel again, coming to this table. Won't you come to this communion table in repentance and faith? Won't you fall to your knees in wonder and awe at the power and majesty of Christ? Yes, it's true, a paralyzed man got up. Yes, it's true, he was carrying his mat. Yes, it was true, the crowd said, hey, isn't this the guy that just was carried up the stairs a moment ago has now walked out the door? It's all true. But you know what's even a greater truth is that his sins were forgiven and all your sins, plural, past, present, and future can be forgiven. So what stops you from coming up the stairs this morning? What stops you from digging through the roof? What crowd what influence is keeping you from Christ? What obstacle? What pharisaical attitude is causing you to say, well, I'm different from that paralytic, I've got it together, when in fact, you are in as desperate need? What can wash away your sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So come this morning, look at the cross, and let those words wash over you. My son, my daughter, your sins are forgiven. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, where would we be without mercy and without grace, without you initiating this rescue operation for us? Lord, breaking through the heavens, coming and walking our streets, coming this infinite distance to find us. And then Lord, with the ropes of your love, lowering grace into our hearts. Oh Lord, we just thank you for what we don't deserve. I just pray that Lord, as we meet week by week and we 
hear your word preached as we worship together, as we spend time in community groups, as we go about our daily business, as we spend time in your word and prayer, as you meet with us, as we see the wonders of creation. Lord, may this entire song and every chorus and every verse point to Christ and his majesty and his beauty and his wonder and his grace in our lives, Lord. Lord, may we know, uh, Lord, a, a passion for you and for people who don't know you. Lord, to an even greater degree than the things that drive us, for things that don't last, Lord, things that are seen but that are temporal. Lord, may we walk by faith and not by sight, and may we invest, Lord, in a future that we at this point cannot see, and the crowds may say, foolish, who would do that? And yet, Lord, from your perspective, to sell everything we have, and Lord, to buy this field of great treasure is the wisest thing we could ever do. Oh Lord, I just pray that you'd remind us that forgiveness is sweet, may it not grow old. Lord, may we go out with fresh legs that carry us out with the gospel of good news. And may we marvel again at this Lord that we serve. Lord, who has all authority in heaven and on earth, above the earth and under the earth. Lord, may you have the rule and the reign in our hearts today. Holy Spirit, won't you carry us on the mattress of faith to this table this morning where the Lord Jesus Christ would speak again these sweet words of comfort over our lives. So I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.